Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lamont Young, and I want to welcome you to our segment today, What is Art? Designing for the next generation of FinTech solutions. Um, I am the head of digital and customer experience for Citizens, and I'm joined by some awesome panelists. I want to thank everybody for joining our session today. I think this is going to be a great way to end what has been an awesome Boston FinTech week. Uh, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. We want to try to keep this session interactive. And so please use the chat functions in the session to ask us questions throughout. Uh, we will certainly take those questions and get as deep as you guys all want to when it comes to UX and forward thinking design. Um, so now I want to introduce our three awesome panelists. Uh, I get the privilege of speaking with these guys today. So Uday, you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you and your company does. Sure, thanks, Lamont. So I'm Uday Karaju. Uh, I'm a human-centered designer by profession. So I've been doing that all my life. So, so but now I'm the CEO of a company called Bond.ai. Uh, it's an artificial intelligence, we call it human-centered artificial intelligence platform for banks. So what we've done is we've created something called an empathy engine, which actually powers our AI and helps banks really understand their consumers so that they can help them in every way they can, especially during the last two years, we've done a lot of good work for consumers and banks. So the Empathy Engine and our human-centered AI is basically helping, it's a win-win for banks and consumers. So human-centered AI is at the core. Awesome. Joe AI, can you introduce yourself to everyone? Sure can, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I lead up UX strategy and design under Catherine Lynch. Uh, here at Citizens in our cleverly called group Green Pixel Studios, you see a little bit of branding. Uh, I've been in product design since the late 90s, um, working in the Boston startup scene for companies like Drizzly, uh, Buzz Agent, and at different agencies like Sapien and VML. Uh, I've worked in some big projects um, across the industry, so helping CVS launch their CarePass uh, extension to their loyalty program, or Dunkin' Donuts launch their mobile and social strategies. Um, and yeah, on a personal note, I love, uh, long walks on the beach and short lines at the bank. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I love the beach as well, but, um, I'm Catherine Lynch. I'm the head of UX at, uh, uh, citizens. I think of myself as, uh, really the chief linebacker for the team. Uh, I just clear blocks and and uh, make space on the field so the really talented uh, user experience professionals can can do their magic and uh, score some touchdowns. Um, I come from a, a long line of uh, financial services work in the digital space, digital marketing, product design, and uh, different delivery levels for uh, companies like BBVA, uh, Guarantee Bank, and uh, led a lot of different areas, including analytics as well and so uh on a personal note i uh, also like the beach but uh and i have two dogs that came from texas with me and do not like the snow <laughs> awesome awesome so you know this session is is designed to talk about both the art and the science of of user experience and user design um and candidly whether you are a startup or you're like us, the 11th largest financial institution in the country, uh, we know user design and experience is critically important to delivering a differentiated experience to customers. So, so Catherine, given the fact that I'm actually sitting in your design studio here in Westwood, Massachusetts, it would be great maybe to give the audience a sense of why, you know, citizens, a hundred plus year old financial institution decided to invest so heavily, not just in building out a team, but all these cool facilities that we actually have to drive our, unique design experience. Absolutely. Well, everyone that, that knows something about UX and you can do an easy Google search and you can learn about the value of investing in customer experience and user experience and you get the returns on that investment. But what you also figure out is with the transition to more and more digital experiences and the reliance on that, outsourcing your user experience or, or your CX work starts to cost you as a company a ton of money. So as citizens, we looked at that and decided to insource and create our own team to ensure for a number of reasons, not just the cost savings piece, that's a key driver and certainly, you know, wins over the financial partners that we have at the company. But when you look at the business development gains that you have with teams, they're better connected, 
they're operating together. They're much more efficient. They're more rapidly deploying. You're not ramping up different creative talent into different programs to deliver a design for you. Everyone's already embedded in and working with you much more efficient and allows for better rapid delivery. They're also have their own skin in the game. They're part of the company that's delivering this. They want to see it succeed. It really builds a much better, more collaborative environment to rapidly deploy that. So that's one of the reasons that citizens look at to build this team and build it in-house. Awesome, awesome, great. Hey, Uday, when you, you were describing Bon AI um, and the work that you all do with financial institutions, one of the words that you used was empathy. Um, yeah. Talk to us a little bit about how empathy plays a role when when thinking about design and exact design experience. When you guys know, I mean, you guys know here, but um, the core of human centered design is empathy, right? I mean, and um, not many institutions actually embrace human centered design like you guys do. So I think you're definitely one of the few which actually we've seen in in the industry. But the thing is, I mean, when we talk about UX and UI, of course, those two are two different things, but the center of that is really, really understanding the consumer, right? Unless and until you don't understand the consumer, you cannot do business. It's as simple as that. So empathy, that's why we say, I mean, empathy is you really have to put yourself in the consumer's shoes, understand what they need. It might be a retail consumer or it might be a small business. Everybody has unique needs. And it is very, very important for us. I mean, when we talk to institutions that we do that on day one. So we created this engine called the Empathy Engine, which actually does that for the institution. Puts basically understands the consumer, understands their needs, and on from day one to kind of try to kind of uh, help them establishing whatever they want in their life, achieving their goals and aspirations. And I mean, without empathy, I mean that, like I said, you cannot even start. Awesome, awesome. So hey, Joe, um, one of the things that I've learned from you and your team uh, during your tenure at Citizens is the notion of human centered design. For those folks that are not as familiar with what human centered design is. Uh, why don't you give us a one-on-one? Sure. Uh, and, and Uday already did a, a fantastic job of, of tipping his hand. It's, it's, about, it's about humans and empathizing with humans. So um, understanding who your customer, who your audiences are, researching them well, understanding their needs, designing a solution, prototyping, testing those solutions, and having a way to measure. Um, I think there's a bit more inclusivity implied in human-centered design, that uh, that we aren't just designing uh, the next thing, that we're designing something, again, that really meets a need. And that can be for a variety of audiences and a variety of needs. Um, and, you know, I'm sure hopefully we can, we can talk a little bit about inclusive design and how that uh, impacts accessibility for, um, for all of our citizens' customers. Awesome, awesome. So I'm going to lob a question out that I'm going to ask all of you guys to, to answer. I'll start with Catherine. Um, design sometimes can be subjective. Um, so how do you all build confidence when you're thinking about tackling a project that is being designed specifically for humans? How do you build confidence in th that what you're delivering is going to resonate across all of your clients? Start with you, Catherine. Sure. Um, well, one of the ways you do it is you talk to your customers. And there are ways to do it inexpensively and research while you wait is a, is a great new phrase. We're kind of trying to help share that UX research can be very fast. It doesn't have to be a you know long market research engagement, thousands of dollars, months to, to get to the bottom of it. Right. You can find out some really rapid insights from your customers or, and your segment targets on how they experience what's being designed. And when you look at and just talking about the piece earlier about building the team that's focusing on, you know, helping the company get more efficient, when you've got a team that's actually designing a, a prototype and testing that prototype, even if it's just the paper screens, nobody's even coded the prototype piece, it's just what's called a paper prototype, you can get some feedback to find out about task success. If you get a 30% task success rate, that's not good. That means 70% of the people that touched it failed to do it at first instruction. Okay, that's not good, <laughs> that's bad. So then your development team didn't build it. And, and so then they rethink, okay, what could we do? What's more effective? Asking those customers that question. And then that can actually be retested and validated that now your task instruction effectiveness went up. Then you know, hey, let's spend the 25 
grand for the week or 50 grand for two weeks to have an agile team build it, that, that what you're building is more likely going to deliver the success measure you need and, and the task effectiveness. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Joe, you want to touch on that and then we'll have Uday also give his perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will. I will. Yes. And where, where Catherine's coming from, there's, there's a lot of ways to get closer to customers. Um, uh, way back in the year 2000, when we were first in the, in the first bubble, uh, I was, I was at Sapient and we would not take on a project unless we had a substantial, uh, experience modeling phase. So clients couldn't tell us the problem. We wanted to make sure that we understood the problem and there had some grounding there, but not everyone had a million dollars to talk to customers where, uh, to Catherine's point, there are a lot of ways to get much closer to customers and de-risk product development. I think that's, that's realistically the world that we're living in. We want to be fast. We want to be nimble. We want to get to MVP as quickly as possible. So we understand that behavioral data as well, but it is much cheaper to move around boxes and arrows in the design phase than it is once you get to code. So uh, there is a confidence curve that uh, that we talk about here, and it's getting getting solutions, talking to customers about their jobs to be done uh, early, and then and then often to validate those designs even before MVP. Yeah, great. Right. I mean, it's spot on, right? I mean, what Catherine Joe said, I mean, especially on that 70, 30 stat, it's absolutely important because if you have a 30% success rate, it's not enough. You need to have as close to hundred as possible. So, I mean, what we do really is, I mean, when we talk to an institution, they come with their problems. These are the problems, but again, we have to validate it that with the consumer. So if a bank or financial institution has like hundred thousand consumers, a small sample size of 5,000 might not reflect the whole views of the consumers, right? So, mm -hmm. so what we really do is, I mean, we kind of, flip the script where in, in the olden days you guys know that we all used to assemble in a focus group define five or six personas and kind of generalize all these consumers into the five or six so that's not what we want to do right so what we do is let the data define the persona so that instead of having five personas we're like hundreds and thousands of personas so essentially uh, when we say about we need to talk to the consumer we use conversational ai to talk to the consumer so step one we are kind of use the existing data of the consumer build those personas we um, we predict something some needs of that consumers but we, we haven't validated it that with the consumer so we have these tools like the bots and conversational ais right now so what we really do is okay we have the personas we identify the needs and now go ahead and converse with your consumers contextually and validate it that's the most important piece here so once you validate with your consumers now it's it's all about design is all about iteration so your product your prototype is constantly evolving but it's evolving in with the feedback of your consumer so we've seen a very good success rate in terms of that. It's We call it real-time prototyping because it's always real-time, talking with the consumer all the time, getting it done. Everyone is happy. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, guys, we've got, a, I think, a great question from, from the audience. And so um, I'll ask for the citizen's perspective first, and then we'll talk uh, from the Bon AI perspective. So the question from Alex is, how do you balance designing the next thing and pushing the envelope versus meeting customers' current needs? So Joe or Catherine, who wants to give the citizens perspective on that? I, I can, do you want me to, you want me to go first? Yeah, I, 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 first. I love that question. We, we talk about that all the time and there's a bit of table stakes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and I know we've been beating the drum of, of first off getting, getting close to your customer, understand what their jobs to be done, understand what, what their needs are. Also understanding what the comp, what the competition and what their expectations are in a landscape. And I will say customer expectations aren't just, um, you know, in, in your direct competitor set, customer expectations are getting raised by their last best digital experience. Particularly now we see that, uh, you know, coming out of the crazy year and a half that we've all been, it is super frustrating to not be able to make an appointment or not being able to do everything in a digital space up to the point when you, when you actually want to talk to someone. Um, so start, create a space for innovation. Um, and that means literally the time, some of that is, is time to do it. And we do that a couple ways. We have enabling pieces here. We have a design system that allows us to not resolve the common problems repeatedly. So if you are, uh, building a, a beautiful house, I'll use, I'll use a brick and mortar metaphor. 
I would suggest not spending time rethinking the stairs, right? That is a that is an established pattern. People want to know exactly how that behaves. There is time better spent elsewhere. Um, so we're able to move faster by building off of patterns and building specifically off of components in our design system library. So we can actually spend that time, repurpose that time that we spent on production, talking to customers, talking about what their jobs to be done are. Um, there's also a lot of areas that you can innovate that aren't necessarily the next shiny object. It's making some, it's, we're talking really about ease of use. Can you make something more simple? Can you make a whole process easier um, and more intuitive? And there are some, again, uh, there are some, there are some real, there are some real table stakes, but human centered design goes back to the heart of, of innovation. If you, if you give it space, trying out ideas, understanding needs, getting a prototype in front of customers. And again, not, not resolving, not resolving the problems that don't need to be resolved. And I would just add that, that, you know, I don't think I've been anywhere that doesn't struggle with that at times, the next shiny object from the, um, you know, the, the current day to day and that balance, that tension of short term versus long term planning. I think that is just a challenge for everybody in, 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 in any company. But sometimes when you need to get a little more space to balance some basic table stakes that maybe need to be improved and, and some bandwidth to improve the experience of what's out there because there is that balance tension too of the next feature to add versus just continue some continuous agile improvement of what's there is that maslow's hierarchy has sometimes been super effective to get some people to give us the time and space to do some basic work because if you can't get in and do certain table stakes things your customer base is not going to give you the the, the, the time to do any of the other cool things that you're thinking up. So that, that has been successful for us and to get some people to, to give us space to do that. Yeah. I mean, like Joe was mentioning, I mean, I, we always say at Bond is the only thing changing faster than technology is customer expectations, right? So it, they're changing at a rapid pace. So, I mean, these, the next best things don't come out of thin air. The iPhone did not come out of thin air. There were touch screens existing before. It's all about kind of mapping, predicting those customer expectations, identifying on what really need and perfecting it and then launching it. So it's again, going back to talking to the consumer, managing those customer expectations and predicting the right thing. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys, we've got another question from the audience and the audience is starting to warm up a bit. I think this mm -hmm. is a really good one. <laughs> um, sometimes the problem that UX is asked to solve might not actually be the root of the problem, but just the symptom of the root of the problem. How do you guys go about finding the true underlying issue and making sure that you're solving the right thing? I think that's a great question. We'll get the Bond AI perspective first and then we'll go to citizens. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always the case, right? I mean, it's it not necessarily in, in terms of user experience. Yeah, it's not necessarily the, the underlying issue. But again, uh, I'm saying this again and again is we do that by taking feedback from the consumer. It's it's a simple formula. I mean, we have the formula set, like I told you, we use conversational AI. The reason why use we conversational AI is to talk to the consumer. So use that, get feedback and rectify it. As simple as that. It's not, I mean, it's really not that complicated if you listen to the user. Right, right. Citizens? Yeah, if I could if I could build on that one quickly. Yeah, um, um, wholeheartedly agree with, with Uday. Um, I will say one one common misperception though of, about uh, about human centered design, and as we stress talking to customers all the time, it's not just doing everything that a customer says. It, and I think that is probably where where the question is coming from is um, if somebody is explaining a symptom versus the root cause of a problem. So I know I think everyone's probably familiar with with you know, with the double dime inside of delivery, discovery leading into design. Um, we're looking at a little bit more of a well-rounded, uh, rapid research phase. So we look at voice of a customer analysis. So what customers are actually complaining about, uh, we use user testing.com to do a lot of remote testing. We do in-person testing as well. So Lamont is, uh, I, I he's sitting, sitting in the lab, sitting in a beautiful <laughs> in-person research lab in Westwood, Massachusetts, that we are all very excited that in-person conversations are, are returning to the forefront, um, as well as uh, 
as well as looking at some behavioral data. So we have we use Glassbox for session replay to see where folks are, are actually struggling in a real world environment. So it's not necessarily just reacting to uh, to what one customer says or what one stakeholder says. It's it's looking at it a little bit more of a well-rounded picture of attitudinal and behavioral, and then proposing a hypothesis of what a solution and getting that in front of customers. Um, I mean, we, we've seen some examples where uh, there's a lot of excitement around engagement. And in, in engagement is, is one important metric to track. But customers could have a higher engagement because they are struggling in an area. So I'm hitting a page repeatedly, not because I'm getting enjoyment out of it, because I'm looking for something that I can't find. Exactly. Um, so it's, again, it's getting that a little bit more well-rounded picture for the why, not, not just the what. And, uh, and I think we've been somewhat purposeful on talking about designing for customers' needs, not solely just on customer wants. I, the only thing I'd, I'd piggyback on that too is, is, is maybe a, a quick and dirty tactic that can be utilized is I'm big on pushing um, what we're calling high level journey maps or flows. And, and guys, this can be a quick workflow, like good old fashioned, you know, boxes and squares and circles. It doesn't have to be, you know, super detailed. But if you can just get these journey flows down, um, that could be a tactic that can really help your, your organization think about what is happening where. Because one of the other things that to be really great at UX design, you have to be thinking about where the customer was how they got to you, what they're doing while they're there, and where they're going next, because you're not going to design a great experience if you don't. So so sort of this blending blur between UX and CX, we're all in, in bed together, and we've got to think about rapid ways to get that done, because you may not have time to do a deep journey service blueprint analysis, and, and, and you know, if you're at a fintech, you don't have time to do that. You're moving so fast, but do a workflow get that down and kind of then look at what's happening where, and that may help you identify that root problem. So, okay, I can fix the symptom, but guys, here's the big problem. Awesome. Thank you guys. So we've got a couple more audience questions. One from a good friend of citizens, Devin Kincaid is asking this question, guys, what percentage of customer feedback during design would you characterize as didn't know we didn't know? So, <laughs> so literally, as you're getting feedback from customers and all of a sudden there's a lot of stuff that comes out of that feedback, um, like what part of that percentage is simply, hey, the customer had you discover something brand new that you just weren't thinking about. As I think it's the gist of Devin's uh, question. So how about we get the bond AI perspective first? Oh, we start with a blank slate. So most of the time for us, it's 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, just sad because we don't we don't go in with uh, a pre some pre prejudice or some assumptions, right? It, it's that's the golden rule. Is I think completely be open. So I mean, but I, I, on an average, I think we see about forty percent, thirty five to forty percent of uh, stuff we haven't realized, which is actually fantastic for us. Good, good. Uh, citizens, want to give the our perspective? Yeah, we've got different oh, perspectives. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, sure. I'm <laughs> I, I, I love Uday's answer once again. Um, I, it's fine. I've been, I've been a Citizens customer for, for 25 years. Um, and the second I walked in the door here, I had to realize I am no longer a Citizens customer. So I am, I am too close to everything that we are, that we are doing. Um, so there, all the feedback that we are getting, it is extremely important that we're, we're not just talking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, we have some strong hypotheses, um, or I, I like to say that we have some strong points of view that are loosely held, meaning I feel confident this is the right solution, but if external customers are telling me different, we're going to go, we're going to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Um, so a hard percentage, it's, it's hard to say, yeah. but I, but I will say that it is, uh, it is, it is through constant conversation and validation and those external voices um uh can be as as simple as as a quick as a quick five person usability test to as complex as a deep dive into all of our customer care calls. Okay. And I would just say that that from a from a 
tactic standpoint too, you know, there's some amazing tools that, you know, and Joe mentioned one of them, uh, you know, where you can do the electronic uh, user testing and virtually get a lot of information. But I think you will get more nuggets when you're sitting there with the person look physically kind of going through the test with you because the think out loud study that's recorded, you still will get great stuff. But when you're sitting there with the person and you see the beads of sweat breaking out on their forehead because they they're, they're struggling with something, they're not saying they're struggling with it. So a think out loud study wouldn't catch that. Um, you're, you're able to probe on that and get a little more nuance of, of some amazing, we didn't know what we didn't know in those kind of type of settings would be, you know, the one thought I would have, but, uh, you know, otherwise sometimes the tests are structured such that we're testing certain hypotheses and then we get the validation of it or yeah, we didn't think they were going to like it and they didn't like it. It's like, okay. So I think that but you can get some great nuggets that way. Got it. Great guys. Um, hey, we've got a really, I think, awesome question from, from Steven in the chat. Um, that I think is not only relevant to uh, large companies like Citizens with diversified product lines, but as fintechs start to diversify from single product groups to, to multiple product groups, I think Stephen's question is Zapper Pro. So he's asking, how do you prioritize innovating new products and offerings? What is the balance of influence based on customer need versus the needs of various business lines? So that age old added, you know, who do, who, who do we support? Do we support the customer? Do we support the business? I suspect the answer you guys are going to have is a little bit of both. Um, so uh, why don't we get the Bon AI perspective first? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a little aggressive on that side because we are a fintech. <laughs> so we, we, <laughs> we lean towards the customer because, I mean, we've seen, I mean, we've seen a number of projects by financial institutions fail big time because they've invested a lot of money, but they don't translate it well because the, the lines of businesses, I mean, that side of the need is taken care of more rather than the user's need. So stride, right from day one, we are very aggressive that it has to start from the user's needs, as simple as that. And we've seen, I'll, I'll give you some statistics, and we've seen in our implementations of whatever clients is, uh, when we start with the user, it automatically aligns with the needs of the lines of the businesses. There's no doubt, right? And the kind of revenue you get is, uh, for example, we see stats like if we just implement a system like that, uh, the, the the banks are actually uh, missing about 1% based on their asset size and revenue. So if it's an $800 million bank, they're missing about $8 million in revenue. It's huge, right? So I think it has to start with the user, no doubt for us. Awesome. Joe, Catherine? Um, I think it, it, this, is a, this is a really uh, great question because there absolutely are tensions, right? That, that, that It's a tension there and it's, it's that long-term, short-term kind of, you know, tension we talked about earlier as well of, keeping the lights on and making money and making sure we're really delivering on those customer needs. So, so how do you balance that and how do you balance that effectively? And I think, you know, one of the things where we've seen some real success is with outlining what the customer needs are and really bringing that research forward into the different conversations. And I don't want to totally paint a utopia, right? There are days where it's, it's easier than others. And, and there's folks that are, that have drank the UX Kool-Aid and they're with us for the ride. But um, there, and then there's other folks that, hey, there's a balance sheet issue and people are trying to fix the balance sheet issue and that's got to get fixed. And, and I personally have worked for a failed division, a failed bank, <laughs> and a failed startup. So I've, I've ridden the waves of, you know, finding myself, you know, need a new job and, and, and trying to save sinking ships and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm really keenly aware of fixing balance sheet problems. And so, um, you know, I, I support trying to help educate those folks so focused on some of the balance sheet piece that maybe they're losing the forest from the trees and they're not really thinking about, hey, your customers are going to leave if, if you're just so focused on this and we're not thinking about their bigger breadth. And I think bringing the voice of customer feedback in that actual customer verbatims are so powerful and or recordings of them, even the digital recordings of them on a user electronic user test are really powerful to, to, to stop people in their tracks. Awesome. Awesome. Hey guys, before we go to the, uh, the, the next audience question, I, I do want to um, ask one that I think is related to what you guys just talked about. So, um, you know, we talk a lot internally, Catherine, about the the, the value ratio within uh, UX. You know, how do we determine whether or not uh, a dollar invested in, in in user design or experience 
um, you know, generates a, a two dollars when it comes to return on investment. So, can you talk a little bit about how you and the team internally, mm -hmm. the citizens, does that valuation? And then, um, Uday, it, it's really your business. Um, so, I'd love for you, after Catherine talks, talk a little bit about how you uh, do that valuation for clients. So, Catherine. Sure. You can you can do a quick Google search and you can find a ton of research from Forbes or Forrester or anybody that talks about the value of UX and CX. Right? So you can get that industry justification that you need. But one of the things we did internally at Citizens is we created what's called a value, a cost to value creation ratio, where we took the outsourced expenditures of what the types of production of our UX assets would cost us and map that up against the production of that you of, the, of those critically important UX assets, your research studies, your designs, your, your design thinking sessions, your code that we build for the prototypes, things like that, what that would cost you to get that externally. And we map that together to say that's your cost of value creation ratio. And we're able to show, I mean, in last year, we saved the bank $14.2 million. And so when you can make those kind of savings, the, the companies vary from, especially a financial company is very interested in continuing that investment to ensure that they're able to get that good UX at the at, at a really good affordable rate and and really see that the increase of their experiences now as you move up the UX maturity scale as a company you have to adjust those ratios and you also have to ensure that you're overlaying actual quality measures to that because you want to make sure that you're getting good improvement in NPS and your, your super cure, your usability measures are good. That, like Joe mentioned earlier, engagement is not just, well, somebody's in the page for a long time. That's not necessarily a definition of task success, depending on what the task was. So you want to make sure that if you're gaining engagement, you're getting the right kind of engagement. So you've got to overlay those elements or you're going to miss the force from the trees in terms of, of how that value ratio can really help inform what you're producing. And then you can also look at it from, you know, hours and actual asset production and, and you blend the two to overlay as kind of um, checks and balances of each other. Yeah. I'm absolutely I'm spot on. I mean, Catherine, I think uh, we're talking about art, right? For us as a FinTech, the art is also to convince the, the client to invest in UX, right? Mm -hmm. so, the, so how do we do that? I mean, we have to do that the first time we meet, right? It's like the, the elevator pitch for that. So I think what we simply, again, going by simply do is, we ask them, hey, give, give a sample size of your transaction data and give it, we run it through the engine real time and say, hey, if you invest in this, this is the amount we'll actually, you're missing today. This is the million dollar revenue you're missing. And this is the ROI for you. I mean, that's a magic formula for us. This is the amount of money you're missing, and this is the ROI for your three months or four months, whatever it is. You have to invest in UX. It's a benefit for you and your customer. Awesome, awesome. So I'm gonna go to the next audience question, guys. Uh, this is from Deepak, and I'm gonna try to paraphrase, paraphrase the question. Uh, the thought process just basically goes with AI and machine learning growing. We've seen co companies go from chat bots to now full virtual assistants. As you guys sort of think about future uh, state trends in in UX, right? When do you believe that we'll be able to use AI and machine learning at scale to truly deliver, whether it's through bots or other things, a personalized experience when it comes to the design side of the house of UX? Why don't we start with the Bon AI uh, perspective? Because candidly, that's the business that you guys are in. So, <laughs> Deepa, Deepa, great question, Raman. So I think, um, I mean, the thing is, again, like I said already in, in the session, bots and the virtual assistants are pretty key, especially when you're talking about human-centered design. So because, I mean, that's the only way, because nowadays nobody goes to the branch. So customer, I mean, bank, bankers do not see their customers. So what is the way for them to interact? Is that The only way for them to interact is this through this conversational AI and these bot platforms. And, and there's a way, like, I mean, you can measure NPS score. I mean, you can measure a lot of stuff, and you also can collect information. So I think... I mean, this absolutely is very, very important. Even if, if you're not doing your personalized recommendations or even if you're not doing that big AI stuff which is being promised, I think using that conversational AI just to collect feedback and talk to your consumer, knowing where they are, what they want, is very, very critical. I think that's what we need to do. Awesome. Joe, you want to answer that question from the citizen side of the house? Yeah. Um, I mean, conversational... I mean, we're looking at conversational copy, not just in AI, but just how are we talking to customers in uh, in a digital space and having a more human connection. So, uh, yes, personalization, uh, relevant content, 
uh, chatbots, uh, and even in, in some cases, we are using digital to drive to an in-branch experience as well, uh, knowing that customers have have certain needs. They, they all they want advice. They want to be able to get advice sometimes from a human when when they're making some major decisions, as well as um, as well as feel empowered to do as much on a digital device as they would like. Awesome. Awesome. Um, another question from our, our audience, and I promise you to Joe and Catherine, I did not plant this one, but I know you guys are always recruiting. So Mary is asking, what backgrounds are you looking for for, for UX talent? We'll go with the citizen's perspective first, and then we'll talk about uh, Bon AI. What are you guys looking for when you're trying to source UX talent? Um, you know, Joe can get, certainly touch on some of the, the granular details and some of the background. But one of the things I would say is we really look for, for one key thing. We were very purposeful, purposeful on when we started the studio was real diversity of background. We want diversity of thinking. We don't want a bunch of UX personnel that have all worked in financial services. We want consumer brands. We want uh, physical presence locations. We want all, you know, media, music industry. We want, you know, PayPal or Dell. We want, you know, Ford. We, we've had a lot of people uh, across in, in our teams that have been with different brands so that they're thinking about that because, you know, I think Joe mentioned it earlier too, is that your last best digital experience is not necessarily going to be with some other bank that you're comparing bank to bank. You are comparing your last best experience with Amazon or, um, you know, Apple or Android to, to, oh, I came to citizens and this and this and this happened. Right. Or this happened. Great. It's just like Apple or Amazon. It was seamless. It was wonderful. It was easy. And so we want a lot of diversity of thinking there to help us think about and keep accessibility in mind because accessibility also really changes across, you know, different people's life experiences and different and different consumer needs. So, um, I think that in, in, as a broad, Odd topic, but I'm I'm gonna kind of kick to Joe and maybe say a little bit more detail on the background. Sure. Yeah. It's pretty, um, yeah. UX is a pretty wide spectrum, uh, and like Liam Neeson, we're recruiting for a certain set of skills. So we we are bringing in uh, both specialties, but also uh, full stack has become a little bit of a term in the industry. So we do have folks that concentrate on on research, on the formative and generative side, particularly, but bring in. Um, a wealth of skills and different techniques. We have UX UI designers, and we have that slash in there because they are doing the low fidelity wires and flows, as well as executing into high fidelity design. So we have a design system that we're pulling from, but we are constantly maturing and contributing to that design system as well. We have design engineers on our team that do uh, that have that sort of right brain, left brain split. So hopefully the designs that we are uh, that we are creating with our customers and with our stakeholders are actually getting uh, into the customer's hands the way that we envisioned and have the right level of interaction and interactivity. And then we have design thinking, which is really close to human-centered design, but we're looking at uh, we're looking at it for bursts as well as real innovation uh, across the bank as well. We have. Uh, and then I'll round out. I feel like I'm talking a little too long, but we have voice of a customer uh, uh, as part of our team as well. So really, um, someone dedicated to making sure that we understand what's happening in uh, in app stores and we're listening to customers and getting the feedback mechanisms and that's bubbling up the team. And we are all part of, of the accessibility team to Catherine's point, making sure that what we're designing for um, is appropriate for all of our customers, regardless of their needs and disabilities. So that's a longer winded answer to say, uh, there's a lot within a UX spectrum, um, but we are specifically hiring for folks with skills, um, you know, in design, in research, in development. Um, but we're all we're all looking for folks that really care about the customer and are designing purposefully with that research fueled approach. Yeah, I'll keep it short. Interest, interest, and in simple answer. I think we're looking for those um, T-shaped people. We call it T-shaped. Right, so having a core UX skill, but like you guys were saying, Catherine and Joe, I think that top of the T, I think they have to have a variety of exposure to different things. And the most important thing for us is also as keeping the UX team diverse, people from various backgrounds, because they feed off each other and more T T-shaped people in the team, the more beneficial for UX in general. Awesome, awesome. So 
guys, again, not another plant question. I'm just uh, asking you guys what, what is showing up in the chat. But here's a question. Should employees be encouraged to open and maintain accounts at competitors in order to really understand the experience other firms are offering the customers? So I'm going to actually answer that question because I actually <laughs> do. Um, as Catherine and, and Joe know, I probably have accounts at about 35 financial institutions. And part of that is it's part of it's truly indeed competitive intelligence. Um, um, not only uh, do I love to sort of get the the, the direct feel of of, of what our, our our competitors are offering, mm -hmm. I tend to know most of my peers, and so I get an opportunity to sort of comb through what they're doing from a design standpoint, an experience standpoint. I get to ask questions if they if they're willing to sort of answer those things. So I always think it's sort of great to understand and keep up with your competition. So I'd answer that question with a definitive yes, but certainly would love to get. Uh, Joe or Catherine or Uday's perspective on that one. <laughs> um, I would echo the yes as well. I think it is a great source. Um, the one caution I would give though is you never know what's not working for that other vendor. And what we see a lot is we have some business lines going, go make it just like so-and-so. We just want it to look like so-and-so. And we're like, well, well, we're talking to your customers right now and we're hearing this. And Let's, we need to think about this piece. And the bottom line is, you know, unless your best friends over there telling you that, that confirming the re, their research data says something else, you really don't know what's not working for that company and what they're maybe needing to change or may have a project about to change it. So um, that's the, the only caveat I'd give is, is um, think about what kind of research you need to validate on your own before you put too much investment chasing somebody else. Awesome. Yeah, th that's a great point, too. I mean, absolutely right. I mean, Catherine. And also another thing we uh, notice, I mean, the more you spread across, I mean, kind of look at various things, the core is actually diluted in your mind, right? So the, what, you're, what you want to do is kind of influence most of the time. So, I mean, yeah, you have to do it, but I think you have to be kind of balanced. balanced you do need to do a balance act in doing that. Because you want to uh, use the known patterns, right? Yeah, exactly. that's, that's the benefit of that kind of comparison is you get some, some of that known pattern usage, but... You just don't right. want to isolate down and chase a competitor that maybe right. is in the middle of fixing, changing something that you don't know about. Yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll just add on, these are great conversations to have with people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk about what their, what their last banking experience was. Yeah. Talk about what their best banking experience was. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Lamont, to your point, looking at the competition also just gives you fodder to, to talk mm -hmm. to, you know, talk to folks in your friend, talk to your friend network, your family, mm -hmm. um, all just ways to get closer yep. to to what yeah our customers actually need. Well, and the plus side of it too, when you have those 35 accounts Lamont was talking about at different places, is when that person, that junior frustrated creative director of some line of business is trying to get you to put this thingy over here, and but all the other ones happen in the upper right-hand corner and that established pattern they're trying to get you to deviate it from, you've got some justification there to say, no, 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 we don't want to deviate yeah. from that known pattern. So right. you definitely want to do it. There's value to it. Awesome. All right, guys, we've got about 10 more minutes left in our, our, our segment. You guys have been amazing. We've got lots of awesome audience participation, but I want to try to pivot and cover our last two topics. Um, so, so the first one is I'd love for both of, both citizens and, and Bond AI to give a little bit of perspective on where you see trends in the future when it comes to, to UX. And funny enough, we've got a question in the chat that kind of points to that. Um, so give me some sense of what you guys are sort of seeing as, in terms of future state trends in UX. Um, talk to me about what things might uh, be coming up that go beyond just the phone, right? As we think about uh, the internet of things, if we think about going beyond just uh, the small screen, like what are some of the trends you guys see in design and usability that our audience might uh, might necessarily need to start to research or be concerned about or put on the radar screens. Alexis, Catherine, go, you yeah, let's, let's, let's go first. Yeah, yeah. Catherine, please. No. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll let Joe expound on this. I know he looks at this stuff all the time. So I'm going to let the expert sure. go. <laughs> sure. I, I'm, yeah. And we, so we talk, we look at a couple fronts. I mean, um, I know Uday was specific uh, on mm -hmm. distinguishing UX from UI. On the UI side, you know, you see a lot of you see a lot of trends from, you know, how are we looking at mobile first, high contrast text, um, large font size, broken grid so it works on mobile so folks can folks can scroll a bit more, black design 2.0, 
um, which is sort of bringing in a little bit of more of that morphic um, element. So real world elements now into flat design. If everyone's looking for a $2 word on a Friday. Um, but I think the heart of the question for UX, expectations are getting much, much higher for all of us. Um, inclusive design, I know we've touched on it. accessible design is is critical. 20% of, of, of the United States has some form of disability, um, whether it's uh, whether it's vision or hearing or motor skill or cognitive skills. Um, and that's not even talking about situational uh, disability, whether you have uh, a broken arm or, or, or a screaming child that's really distracting you um, from your task at hand. I know um, Lamont regularly talks about you you wouldn't go into a branch and not have a ramp because you because you're eliminating some audiences. But in in digital and design, it's still way too prevalent that we are not considering um, all of our customers and a particularly a customer base that is going to be that much more loyal. So uh, that has been one that's been out there for a while, but. <laughs> expected that things uh, work for all of our customers across all of their devices. Um, and, and whether that is uh, not just mobile now, but you have wearables. Um, we have so that voice user interface that how do you expect to get some value from um, from your financial institution there? Uh, and the big, big one for that we are talking about on a regular basis is how do we be moral, uh, morally, ethically, valuably use customer data? And how do we put customers in control of their data, particularly as we are providing more relevant, personalized experiences and using that data for ease of use? So you don't have to pre-fill information. You don't, um, we're skipping steps in applications, but there is a serious potential creep factor there if you don't do it well. So. Uh, that goes also back to the heart of how are you talking to customers in real language? How are you, how do customers feel in control of the situation? And again, how do um, uh, customers really feel included um, and have a relationship with your with your institution? Sometimes only in digital. Awesome. Yeah, I think so. I, I think I'll again. The thing is. Um, I, we see that the patterns, I mean, right now going ahead, the trends going from flat design. I think we are definitely at the stage we are going to embrace virtual reality and augmented reality. So I think it's definitely going to go from flat design to 3D design. There's no doubt in that. People are wanting that. The customer expectations are going towards that. You see the industry going towards that. So in terms of the experience, yes, I think we are seeing a trend of virtual reality being adopted pretty massively in the next few years. But on the other side, I think, like Joe was mentioning, I think we are also seeing a pattern, uh, everybody taking care, I mean, paying attention to mental health, right? So you see a lot, lot of activity happening, right? I mean, the pandemic just has exposed it, which is actually good because, I mean, physical injuries, you can see. I mean, you can see if my arm is bruised or my something, but mental health, you cannot see because it might be more serious. So I think we're seeing a trend where employers, I mean, uh, financial institutions, are everybody kind of paying more attention towards that kind of a better experience so that they can take care of that aspect. So these are the two opposites we are actually seeing. Good. And okay, we got a one, oh, sorry. I'll just throw in to, to yes and to all the great stuff they said is, is when you think about that, that the brands that achieve that CX UX blend of that digital experience that carries into your physical, be it, uh, be it the, the augmented reality or a physical store branch location, the brands that win are going to figure that good connection out. Because if you had an issue, you were working on your phone through your mobile app and you walked into a branch to get some help with it and they could look and see exactly where you were and what, what you'd already worked through with the chat bot, even they see all that and can solve that, that, that kind of blending of that, you know, some people still call it omni-channel. That is going to be um, a real key trend to, to kind of solve. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're spot on there, Catherine, because before the pandemic, I mean, everybody was thinking virtual is the future, virtual is the future. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic has said that it has to be a balance always. So I think, yeah, everybody who can figure that out, you're spot on, will actually win the war. Yeah. Awesome. So guys, we're, we're hearing so much more, whether you are a part of a startup or you're part of a large organization, we're hearing so much more about 
designing for the customer and how critical customer experience is to delivering a product suite. Like, what is it that you guys are personally sort of excited about? If you put aside the business for a second, you guys are all awesome practitioners. Um, and, and in a couple of short words, what are you personally excited about when you think about the UX journey of, of your firms and your own personal UX journey as practitioners? Joe, you want to start? Sure. I, um, you know, I, I am excited that we are making everyday banking much easier for our customers, which again, that's, uh, I, I don't know. I don't want to be dismissive of, of, of some of the table stakes work. Mm -hmm. um, customers come in, they have a task to do. Uh, we're, we're eliminating friction for them in some small ways that's making their life better. And the next part, which I am also equally excited by, not just raising our our app score ratings because we're 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 getting um, we're getting more efficient, effective, satisfying, but really adding value, really adding value to customers. Expectations in banking are pretty darn low in many cases, but to actually provide insights and help customers on a financial journey, um, there's so much opportunity there. Um, I, gosh, I get si excited about a lot of things. I've always been so passionate about how the customer is experiencing what you're trying to do for them. Uh, I think early in my career, I was that bridge between, you know, engineering and no, 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 this is what it needs to do because this is what the customer needs, you know, and I've been doing kind of doing that and thinking about that uh, for so long. But I think, you know, the thing that I think most excites me on a personal level is that we are getting more usable and we are getting more accessible. And I'll just say, you know, on a personal note, you know, I'm, I'm the mother of two kiddos with some disabilities. And, uh, you know, I, I dealt with uh, this week helping my daughter navigate uh, her first kind of banking issue uh, as someone on the autism spectrum. And um, I, I'm excited about our approaches to more accessible for all folks in that and in all areas of disability that that it's part of the way we want to work that that's becoming just such a common thing it's going to make it better for everyone because you as uh i think Udia, you mentioned there's you know you don't see she, she's not in a wheelchair she, she's not physically disabled you wouldn't see her she was standing in front of you and, and she was very struggling on the phone but you know you when you get some great service and, and you get someone just approaching it as a i got to make this accessible for whoever i'm talking to why ever i'm talking to them or they're using my screens and it's got to be the information's got to be clear that uh, I'm seeing us really embrace that as for all, you know, diverse populations and, and that that's just going to make it better and more usable and more simple for everyone. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm more excited. I mean, of the, on the fundamental issue that human centered design and design thinking were actually buzzwords before. Now they're actually becoming <laughs> mainstream. So it's very exciting. I mean, I mean, seeing you guys at Citizens actually having an in-house team, it's, it's really wonderful to, to see that actually. So I think yeah, that's becoming mainstream. Absolutely love it. And the second aspect I think not, not many actually see about, talk about is I think there are a lot of chief design officers coming up nowadays. I think you, you must have seen that. And and those design teams are actually more diverse than any engineering teams. If you see those design teams are maybe equal uh, men and women, I think that's, and, and of course, diverse group groups. I think design is actually bringing that dimension towards what we have always, always been talking about. I think that's actually very exciting for me. Awesome. Hey, Joe, I'm going to throw one quick question from uh, to you specifically from, from the audience, and then uh, we're going to close out on, on, on a question around advice. But the question from Michael, Joe, is how do you operationalize the sharing of user research and analysis so that delivery teams can make better decisions quicker? Sure. Um, yeah, we are. Uh, we are trying to democratize a lot of insights. There's there's data. There's um, there's and potentially a ton of data. So we have readouts in a research live library repository. We have ask a researcher and questions. Uh, we use te obviously technologies like many firms do, like Slack, where we're uh, we're constantly interacting and sharing those uh, sharing those insights. And we're partnered really closely. Um, in our modern operating model with uh, with our experience owners. So product owners in some organizations, experience owners here, where, uh, where we have that truer partnership of UX, product, and technology in that Venn diagram. I think legally we probably always should be, we should have some Venn diagram if we had slides that we always maintaining that 
we have the voice of a customer making those um, in dis informed decisions for a product backlog. So research um, is hopefully constantly informing um, uh, what we're building from, from dev. Awesome. All right, guys, we've got just a couple of minutes left and I wanted to end our segment on, on this. Um, Awesome enough, Kelly Fryer, who is also a friend of ours at, at, at Citizens, is asking sort of the same question. What advice would you all give to not just fintechs um, that are starting their organizations and are looking to build out to the, about their teams, but also large organizations like ours that may want to make the plunge into building out their own sort of in-house uh, 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 design team? So, like, Uday, from your perspective, like, if you think about those early roles that that startups might want to hire as they're sort of thinking about building their organization, uh, what would what that might what might that look like for you, and what advice would you give those startups that might be on the line? I mean, a user research team. I mean, it has to be. I think the, the most important beginning. I, absolutely, there's no doubt. I mean, if you do not start there, I mean, like, like I said, if you don't understand the user, you cannot do business. So you have to have your user research team there. Have at least one of your interaction designers in terms of talking about a title, have them there so that that'll be a great start on your journey, kind of embracing the human centered design aspect, embracing the user centered design aspect so that and then you, your chances of failure will be significantly less because you understand everybody and you're actually designing for the right thing. Awesome. And Catherine and Joe, maybe you guys could give a little bit of taste of that for some of the Larger organizations that are on the the the, uh, the line thinking about bringing their studios in house. Maybe just tell the story of of how we developed GPS at Citizens. Um, I think you know, looking at uh, you know some some of the key areas, right? Research, design, you know, submit you know some development, but don't leave out a few of the specialties that you need to really help augment it. One thing when we that has is really key. And I think it sometimes, oftentimes gets overlooked is uh, it, we call it at citizens copy design, but it's like you, you know, UX copy. Some people call it content strategy at other places where you're really looking at how the integration of the, the words and the information architecture of the page is really helping your user do what they need to do. Um, you know, if you've got research and you've got that kind of specialty bolted in helping you, um, with you, you know some amazing design talent, you can you can start to make so much headway, and and you could start with a good, strong, solid, you know, smaller set of team skills. But that is that is a piece that is is just um, I think is sometimes uh, overlooked. That's critical. Awesome, awesome. Joe. Any uh, any any last minute words to add to that? I mean, you can you can start small. We were we were a pretty scrappy group uh, three years ago. I mean, I would say we're still somewhat in the in the toddler stage, scaling from three to, to sixty plus today. Um, but build allies. UX is often it's about sales. We're not doing anything by ourselves. Uh, we're we're selling to the business. We're bringing customers into the process. Um, product design is really about is about collaboration. So it's not. It's not an agency that's off on an island. It's doing this together. Awesome. Well, hey, guys, thank you so much. I think this has been an awesome session. I really want to thank our audience members who asked some incredible questions. Uh, and um, you obviously can find uh, myself or any of the members of the team, of the panel here on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect with you and talk to you about not only what we're doing um, at Citizens from a design and development standpoint, but I know Bon AI is not only looking for uh, the next generation of colleagues, but also looking for the next generation of partners. So certainly keep in touch with us. Thank you guys so much and have a wonderful rest of the Boston FinTech Week. Yeah, thanks guys. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks.